There's no question that a large part of China's competitive advantage has come from environmental neglect. But the Chinese government's willingness to use pollution as a competitive edge has come at a heavy price. China has the most degraded environment in the world. 16 of the world's 20th dirtiest cities are located in the People's Republic. Less than 1% of their urban air meets the air quality standards set by the European Union. It's difficult to think about what is happening, particularly the lungs of children, breathing air like that. In one fell swoop, you can move your production to China and not have to deal with 100 years of regulations that we've put into place to protect our workers, to protect our society, just by moving your production to China, because they don't have any. They have what we had probably in 1910. The most tragic story is the cancer villages because of toxic metals in the soil, because of the pollution, because the manufacturers have not been forced to clean up their plants. And so essentially what we have is the world's most degraded environment. Whether you're talking about heavy metals pollution, air pollution, water pollution, China's got it all. And particularly for heavy industries like chemicals or steel, the ability to wantonly pollute in China adds up to a huge cost advantage in the global marketplace. If a company like Bao Steel in China is allowed to dump pollution into the Yangtze River when, say, United States Steel Company is not allowed to do the same in the Ohio River, that's going to be a source of competitive advantage for the Chinese because pollution control costs money. It provides them an economic advantage in environmental cost of approximately $40 a steel ton, or represents about 5% of the cost of producing that steel. Is a 5% cost advantage significant? In the steel industry, 5% cost advantage is greater than our profitability. And here's the ultimate irony. The more we allow our American multinationals to offshore production to China, the more total global pollution we create. And a good bit of that comes right back to America by way of the jet stream. Carbon emissions in China per thousand dollars of GNP are seven times what they are in the United States. That leads to carbon emissions and particulate matter falling all along the coast of the United States. 25% of the particulate emissions falling in California are from Asia in general and China in particular. There are good and bad reasons why goods are cheap in the international economy. The good reason is that somebody's a good producer, that they're quick, that they get the, the product to market, they have good technology, that their workers are efficient and well-trained. The bad reason is that the workers are treated like dirt. When the workers in China are being abused, then workers in America have a tougher time competing against them. As an employer in China, do you have any regulations that you have to deal with, like OSHA, labor regulations? Do you have to pay even Social Security or Medicare? Do you have to protect your workers in difficult or unsafe conditions? No. No, 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 no. No, you don't. You go to prison if you try to form a labor union. Freedom of association, the right to organize and bargain collectively are completely absent in China today. There's no equivalent to OSHA occupational uh, safety regulations and they lose about 130,000 men and women to, and that's the ones they report on, to accidents per year uh, that many of which could be prevented with good protection. They don't comply with their own child labor laws, prison labor laws, health and safety laws, minimum wage laws. Well, there's a Dr. Lee who lives in New Jersey who uh, was actually an American citizen, and he was in China, and he was arrested and kept in one of their work camps for uh, three years. When he was finally released, thanks to pressure from the American people, as he came back to New Jersey and he was in the store and he saw these big slippers he'd made in the work camp. Every day, 12, 14, 16 hour a day, you have a labor, you have a quota. Okay, if you cannot complete, finish the quota, you will get a punishment. You will go to solitary confinement. And the police always say, good labor, good food. Less labor, less food. You don't labor, no food. How can Walmarts or anyone else in the United States allow uh, production facilities in China to sell garments, chopsticks, Christmas decorations that are made in forced labor camps? You can go to China, go to every prison camp, you can see what are the prisoners doing. Everybody very busy. What are they doing? Put a button on a shirt. What are they doing? Making the rubber boots. What are they doing? Crowded together, 
assembled the Christmas lights. It's not all about China currency manipulation, but a lot of it is. China manipulates its currency by illegally pegging the value of the Chinese yuan to that of the U.S. dollar at a rate far below market value. Most economists would say that, that China gets from a, anywhere from a 25 to 40 cent advantage for every dollar. So it's like having a tariff on goods coming from the United States of 40 or 50 percent by the amount that they're underpricing the currency. It also gives their exports to the United States a subsidy of 40 or 50 percent to capture our market and, de and knock out domestic industries that might be com competing with them. Simply, an undervalued currency makes Chinese coffee makers $10 a piece instead of 15 or 20, and it makes uh, American cars in China $30,000 instead of 25. In other words, China's manipulated currency acts as a huge subsidy to Chinese exports to America and an equally big tariff barrier blocking American exports to China. The result, more jobs in China, fewer jobs in America, and a huge and chronic American trade deficit with China. The Chinese government does not deny this. Chinese officials themselves say that they fix the value of their currencies to help Chinese workers. When Premier Wen Jiabao was in this country recently, he said, if we allow the currency to float, Chinese companies are going to go bankrupt. OK, but what about American workers? They're cheating on the intellectual property by just flat out pirating stuff from the United States. You don't want China to get their hands on your latest piece of technology or whatever, because they will copy it and they will turn around and, and produce it. Most famously, copyright pirates in China are stamping out Disney DVDs. That's what everybody knows of. What's more important is the theft of the blueprints, for example, for high technologies. I mean, I hear all the time about American companies who find themselves competing in the marketplace with a Chinese product, and they take it apart, and they find themselves looking in the mirror because the Chinese have just stolen the plans of their own product. And one of America's highest tech companies has certainly experienced this kind of piracy firsthand and a school of very hard knocks at the hands of the Chinese government. Google came into the Chinese market, and of course, it ended up with a dominant market share. But Beijing wanted Baidu, a local company, to be able to outpace Google. What Beijing did was it hacked Google's network, it stole its source code, and now Baidu has more than 75% of the China search market. This shows that basically Beijing wants the local companies to be the national champions. But sometimes Chinese pirates aren't content just to steal the intellectual property of an American corporation. Sometimes they just take the whole company. So Fellows is a company that makes shredders, paper shredders, and they moved, like everybody, they moved their production to China. They uh, hired a company to run their production for them, and suddenly one day their employees were locked out of their own plant. So Fellows went from having a large production base in China one day to the next day their partner suddenly shut them off, shut them down. The moral of the Fellows story is you better be very careful when you move your production to a communist country. It makes no sense that China, who produces 45% of the steel in the world, has high manufacturing costs, yet sells steel at the lowest cost in the world and is growing at a rate of 7 or 8%. This growth from 100 million tons to 700 million tons growing by 50 million tons per year is all due to state subsidy. The problem is that uh, American companies cannot compete because they're not competing with Chinese companies. They're, chi they're competing with the Chinese government. At the end of the day, it most certainly will result in more unemployment in the U.S. and to the advantage of China. We're chumps. So just how big of a chump has America been for supporting China's entry into the World Trade Organization in 2001? 
It's like we're in the Super Bowl of globalization, and in fact, we're being taken apart. And in this Super Bowl of globalization, when you tally up the score on human rights abuses and consider the plight of Tibet, the torture of the Falun Gong, and the crushing of religion and democracy, this much is clear. The Chinese government is the world's worst human rights abuser on the planet today. And when you tally up the score on China's rapid military buildup, this too is clear. China is the only major nation in the world that is preparing to kill Americans. And of course, when you count the jobs lost and factories gone and millions of Americans out of work. American manufacturing has been in an absolute crisis over the last decade. Five and a half million manufacturing jobs gone. 57,000 manufacturing facilities closed in this nation. So you're in a massive jobless recovery. You've got 28 million women and men who are in various stages of unemployment, twice the official number. When you tally up all these scores, it's crystal clear that China's entry into the World Trade Organization has been both a losing and a very dangerous proposition. Even as America has all but completely surrendered its manufacturing base to China. We don't make a single cell phone in the United States. Not one is made in the United States. There is not a single modern flat panel display factory in the United States. Does that matter? Are flat panel displays uh, important for military applications? I think so. They're widely used. Every airplane, every helicopter has them. The United States right now is unable to put a single military aircraft into the sky without using components built by potential adversaries. We produce about $3 billion worth of printed circuit boards in the United States. China produces almost $20 billion. Machine tools, where we, we produce $2.7 billion China's consumption was 10 times that amount. If you don't have a machine tool industry, what, you know, do you have an industry? It's a you know, basic component of an industrial economy. But what about those green industries that some of our politicians say will create the jobs of the future? That's one of the reasons why we're accelerating the transition to a clean energy economy and doubling our use of renewable energy sources like wind and solar power. Steps that have the potential to create whole new industries and hundreds of thousands of new jobs in America. But here's the grim reality. We produce 4% of the world's global output of solar. One of the things happening in the market right now is it's being swamped by low-cost multi-crystalline and polycrystalline uh, silicon solar cells from China. We don't make computers. We don't make printers. We import 99% of our shoes. Mass-produced consumer products, we basically don't make them anymore.